Okay. You all know me. Uh, I'm here to talk about anxiety disorders. And if you don't get the reference underneath, it's because Mel Brooks did a movie that was yeah. called High Anxiety, which is a good movie. And you should go see it. Great way to start off your talk is explaining the jokes. So, <laughs> why I talk on anxiety? Well, you may remember that I gave a talk on ADHD. I actually gave it twice a while back. Um, I'm giving talks on mental disorders because I feel like it's important to talk about them, to bring them forward into the light, to hopefully reduce the stigma around them, and hopefully help people who have them and either don't realize it or do realize it and don't feel like they can get, go get help, that they can go get help. Teach them that that's a thing they can do. Why me? Well, like the ADHD one, um, I'm doing anxiety second because that's the other thing. I have generalized anxiety disorder, which we'll get to later, and I have personal experience with it. Um, I'm also getting relatively familiar with a lot of different things about mental health over the last couple of months, um, some of which I can't talk about. But. So moving on, first thing to know about anxiety is that it isn't just one disorder. There are a lot of anxiety disorders, some of them very interesting. Now, all of these are classified specifically and individually by the DSMV, which is the Diagnostic Criteria Book for Psychiatric Institutions. It is worth noting that the last one there, panic attack, is what the DSM calls a specifier. And what that means is it's like a modifier. It can just go on whatever disorder you happen to have. It's, you know, I have depression with panic attacks. I have post-traumatic stress disorder with panic attacks. It's just, you know, like whipped cream on the top. An additional extra special thing that makes your disorder worse. So, the epidemiology of anxiety. 18 to 11% of U.S. adults have an anxiety disorder. That's about 35 million people. That's any given year. It, anxiety disorders are typically diagnosed more in women than in men. It is difficult to know whether that's genetic, whether that's uh, culturally relevant, or whether it is something more along the lines of women just tend to get diagnosed with it more as because of the way they behave, et cetera, or the way they're expected to behave. It is one of the most common disorders in the US. Anxiety disorders are the most common disorders. Generalized anxiety disorder is the most common reason for disability in the United States. Excluding substance abuse. Between 10 to 20% of all children will develop a full-fledged anxiety disorder before they are age 18. There are a lot of people suffering with anxiety. There are a lot of people grappling with this. And they don't talk about it a lot. These numbers shock me, and I've been digging into this for the past several months. It's really impressive how many people have these and just don't talk about it, don't ever let on that they're dealing with this additional stress in their lives. So before we talk about them as a group, I wanna go through them and talk about what makes them all a little different, why they are different. So generalized anxiety disorder. It's characterized by an excessive anxiety and worry about a variety of topics, events, or activities. It's general. It isn't about any specific trigger or about any specific thing. In fact, it's often about disaster anticipation. And by disaster, I mean anything that can go wrong. I've heard it termed future tripping, and I love that term, because that's exactly what my brain does. Oh god, I have to be prepared if bears attack my car. Actually, I, don't, I have never actually gone on that one, but I have had problems with like, okay, what happens if my battery goes out and my phone is out, and I don't have the right things, and I'm in the middle of Georgia at night? Okay, we need a disaster recovery plan for that. No, you don't. That's odds on that. For starters, I live in Nebraska, so when am I going to be in Georgia? Are, you know, they're ridiculously small. But my brain is very, it's like those people you know who consistently plan for the zombie apocalypse, except it's even more dumb, boring things. <laughs> and it's an over, being overly concerned with these common everyday matters this anxiety about everything you're doing, every decision. So, what it ends up feeling like is it ends up feeling like every decision you're making in your life is life or death. 
like every little decision you make could drastically alter everything. And if you pick the wrong one, not only is everything in your life going to go to hell, but everyone you know knows that you've made a bad choice and now they all hate you. <laughs> it, it pretty much is that. The next one I want to talk about is social anxiety disorder. This one's a little self-explanatory. It's a significant amount of fear between one or more social situations triggered by perceived or actual scrutiny from others. Fear of being the focus of attention is one of the major pieces of social anxiety disorder. And fear of behaving in a way that would be, or would be interpreted as being embarrassing or humiliating. One of the hallmarks of social anxiety disorder is that thing where two people are talking quietly and your brain is just like, oh, they're talking about me and something I did wrong. Now the odds of that are really, really small, especially if they're two strangers you've never met before. But your brain will helpfully spot you with a number of reasons they could be talking about you. You picked the wrong outfit, your hair is all weird, also you smell. I mean, your brain has, trust me, your brain can come up with a lot of different reasons that will seem perfectly valid if you have social anxiety disorder. What it actually feels like is kind of like this. Like you made the wrong decision and now everybody's looking at you and now everybody knows you're weird. You're different from them and now everybody's gonna make fun of you forever and your life is ruined. And you have to move to a new state and burn down your house. <laughs> Panic disorder is the next one. Panic disorders are characterized by recurring panic attacks. If you're not familiar with a panic attack, they suck. There's no clear cause or reason for panic disorder attacks. There are often clear causes or reasons for generic, general panic attacks. Panic attacks, especially in panic disorder, are characterized by short but intense symptoms. And if you want to know what it feels like, it feels like you're having a heart attack. There's no funny gif because it's not funny. Panic attack feels like you are having a heart attack. And in fact, when I took the mental health first aid training, one of the first things they tell you is when you see somebody having a panic attack or you think they're having a panic attack, make sure they're not actually having a heart attack because they feel the same to the person. The only difference is you don't have the arm or chest pain, but your heart is racing. You're sweating. You're going red in the face. There can be numbness in your hands and extremities. You can't breathe. All of these things happen when you're having a panic attack. Phobias are anxiety disorders. You're probably familiar with phobias, a persistent fear of an object or situation that an individual will go to great lengths to avoid. Note that it is typically disproportional to the actual danger posed. I'm afraid of spiders is not a phobia. I'm never going in that room again because I saw a spider is a phobia. They can lead to panic attacks or other prolonged anxiety symptoms, other chronic anxiety symptoms, rather. And they feel like this. Phobia is pretty much the overriding fear or over, overriding uh, emotion is sensation is the desire to run away, to escape from the situation, regardless of anything else. Agoraphobia, which is very, not very, but it is different from phobia, which I learned in the course of making this talk. It is anxiety symptoms and reactions to situations where the sufferer feels uncomfortable and like they feel the environment is dangerous or unsafe. It is not a fear of open spaces. Pretty much, you know, not what everything on the internet is going to tell you it is. So the thing that makes these different now that they're learning about it is they believe that this is actually triggered as a complication from panic attacks. In that you have panic attacks in situations and panic attacks are pretty intense and they your brain really wants to avoid those situations that cause the panic attack and so if you start having panic attacks at multiple locations you tend to avoid the locations where the panic attacks happen and eventually you'll wind up inside your house because usually the things that cause the panic attacks are outside the house unless you are really really depressive and down on yourself I mean that's almost a form of self-harm really and what this feels like is like you want to be alone, like that solitude, not leaving the house, not talking to anybody, not doing anything, that protects you. That prevents you from being triggered 
with this anxiety. Separation anxiety disorder is excessive anxiety resulting from separation from a person. Typically, you will see this in children where it is actually a problem. It's worth noting, separation anxiety is a thing, and it is a normal part of a child's development, and adults feel it too. Separation anxiety disorder is where it is atypical of the anxiety expected for the development level, whether it's a child or an adult. This is literally, I can't function with this without this person around. And it feels like you want to be really close to that person a lot. I know this one's cute. I can't do all terrifying expressing ones. So that's the bulk of the ones I want to run through. There are a couple others up there. Um, some of them are complications that arise from causes that we'll talk about later. But now I want to talk about, now that we've talked about what's they're all different, I want to talk about why they're all the same. Okay? The four things that link all anxiety disorders together, mental apprehension, this mental block, this mental feeling, I guess the future, the future tripping, the constant obsession over uh, how you're doing, what you're doing, what people think of you, that's mental apprehension. Physical muscle tension. When I started taking my SSRI, actually after I started taking the Adderall, uh, I started meditating, I could start feeling, I noticed, my chest literally will get tight when I get panicky. That there'll be a, like a physical knot here. And I can feel it relax as I start to meditate, as I start to actually relax. It's physical muscle tension, like real muscle tension, is intimately linked with actual anxiety. And we'll talk about a therapy that actually relies on that later. Physical symptoms, other generic physical symptoms, we'll get to in a second, and dissociative anxiety. This is kind of the big bad of anxiety. If your anxiety starts to get bad enough, you will start to dissociate. If you're not familiar with that term, that means you will start to have things like amnesia, or dissociative identity disorder, or thinking that the event that occurred to you was a dream. That's dissociation, where you're literally splitting pieces of your identity or experience out. So these four things, and I said physical symptoms, and I lumped those all together because these are the physical symptoms of anxiety. There's a lot of them. And you can get any or all of these, which really sucks. And this isn't even including the ones for panic attacks directly. Those are different. So what's happening in your brain when this is occurring? What is causing this stuff in your brain? <clears throat> they have two main theories. One of them is this a neurotransmitter called GABA. And they believe that a lack of this in your brain helps increase the anxiety symptoms. The other is your amygdala. Nope, that's not working. That red thing up in the middle of that skull, that's your amygdala. That's where a lot of emotion lives. It is specifically where the fear reaction lives in your brain. There was a person who had a calcified amygdala and could not feel fear. She was a fun research subject for a lot of people for a long time. Um, she had a knife to her throat at some point outside of a Kmart and she was just, just fucking cut my throat. She just sat on the guy who had the knife to her throat. He let her go because she was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but the amygdala is the source of anxiety. And what I want to talk about is that anxiety is not maladaptive, okay? Anxiety does not mean, it's not necessarily bad. It was, we evolved anxiety because if you have a really bad experience somewhere, typically you don't want to go back there for a good reason, because you had a bad experience there and you might have a bad experience again. It's really only when this anxiety reaction from your amygdala starts to get really out of proportion to the events or to the uh, situations. That's when you have problems with the disorder. That's where the disorder part kicks in. So it's almost just an amplification of what your brain's always doing. What causes it? Well, like a lot of them, we don't know, 100%. We have some thoughts. For instance, genetics, uh, generalized anxiety disorder, 60% of cases can be explained by genetics, which is good. Now we know that that, but that doesn't always talk about Social, or social anxiety disorder, the rest of them, not always genetic. Evolutionary mismatch is another reason, and that's what I just talked about. It's that mismatch between 
the state of things when we evolved this system and now. In that it's not really a disorder is the thinking from the evolutionary mismatch. It's just that your anxiety system is a little more attenuated than other people's. And it looks like a disorder in the context of the modern era because you're getting all these anxiety signals that don't matter and aren't appropriate, but might be appropriate if you're being chased by tigers on the savannah, ignoring the fact that savannas don't have tigers. Stress is another big cause. It's worth noting that anxiety disorders aren't necessarily guaranteed to be chronic. They can come and go. Stress can cause anxiety symptoms. And if you have enough stress for a long time, you can actually develop a chronic anxiety disorder. It doesn't have to be something that you're born with genetic, and it doesn't have to be something that happens via a single traumatic incident. Drugs and alcohol are another good cause of anxiety. Alcohol abuse in specific, and caffeine and benzodiazepines. Benzos. Both of these will cause anxiety symptoms, especially when you're trying to get off of them. Organic solvents, various organic solvents like paints, lacquers, thinners, those kind of things. Repeated exposure to those can actually cause anxiety. And certain medical conditions, especially ones for endocrine diseases. Pheochromocytoma and hyperthyroidism can both actually cause anxiety. Comorbidity, if you don't remember my first talk, comorbidity is the things, the disorders that will periodically, or rather frequently occur with anxiety. And it's most of them. There's really, it's really hard to draw any kind of lines. The single biggest offender in this pile of shit is depression, because the two are actually fairly closely related, at least in terms of biochemistry, but it's a, it's a grab bag. I mean, depending on how you obtain your anxiety disorder, you could have it comorbid with PTSD, you could have comorbid with ADHD, you could have it comorbid with a whole bunch of different stuff. So how do you deal with it? Well, in decreasing order of preference, therapy. There are two techniques, cognitive and dialectical behavioral therapy. Well, dialectical behavioral therapy is really a subset of cognitive. Uh, developed by Marsha Linehan. And what these are is ways to essentially retrain your brain, to change the way you are thinking about things. And it takes some training and working with people who are trained to do this. Similarly, mindfulness, another way of retraining your mind, retraining the way that you are naturally reacting to things. The last is progressive muscle relaxation. Progressive muscle relaxation relies on that fact I told you earlier that physical tension in your muscles is related to anxiety in your mind. PMR actually has you progressively clench and then release muscles, which relaxes your body and ends up relaxing your mind as well. You can find YouTube videos on it, several good ones. Alternatives to therapy or other, uh, no more caffeine or nicotine. If caffeine's giving you anxiety, yeah, or if you have a lot of anxiety problems, don't drink a ton of, you know, three monsters a day. It's bad for you. Regular exercise, yoga, and massage. Physical activity actually will help your body process anxiety better. Again, partially because this isn't just in the genetic thing. It's not 100% a disorder in the strict sense. It's just one of your systems is going a little overboard for the current era. Drugs, SSRIs, SNRIs are the front lines on this. Lexapro, Luvox, Alexa, etc. Monoamine oxidase inhibitors, which is a drug class that I've never had to take, so I don't actually know what the methodology is behind it, but there are two of the ones that frequently get prescribed for anxiety. So, hopefully, that gives you an overview of anxiety disorders and the scope of what they address and the scope of what they're like. Do you got any questions? Nothing? Or are we all too anxious? Okay, thank you guys very much.